I want a pudgy pig! Coming right up! I want a chunky chicken! And one of those too! It's almost like these episodes were made for each other, which is why we're looking at both in this installment of the all-new Mighty Morphin Jew Rangers. We're back for 2021, and what have we learned so far? Teenagers at a juice bar slash youth center. Ancient warriors making dubious and immediately forgotten connections with random kids. Giant robots that combine. Melee weapons that combine. We pretty much have the gist of these series down, as well as the overall adaptational tricks Saban was utilizing to convert Kyoryu Sentai Judanja into Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. With less to talk about, there's no reason not to move at a bit of a faster clip. Our first matchup today is Food Fight Pitted Against Terror Eaten in an Instant, both of which revolve around a pig monster causing havoc by gorging himself on food that does not belong to him. In fact, he's such a glutton that he eats the melee weapons of our ranger teams who have to find a way to trick him rather than simply brute force their way through. Perhaps the most interesting thing about Food Fight is that according to every source I can find, it was actually the second episode of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers to ever air, placing it ahead of nearly every episode we've already looked at. This created a bit of a continuity snarl as this plot revolves heavily around the ranger's melee weapons that Zordon will then give to them for the first time three days later. Outside of that though, it's easy to see why this particular episode was chosen to air second. Its lack of giant robots creates variety compared to the first episode, demonstrating that not every conflict will be solved the same way. On top of that, I dare say it's the first time that Power Rangers has reached this level of quality since the first episode, crafting a story that does not feel hamstrung by its source material and is fun in its own right. There's far less awkwardness here than in episodes 2 through 5. Plus, it's goopy and messy, which was extraordinarily appealing to 90s kids raised on Nickelodeon and its endless supply of pies and green slime. It's obvious why either Saban or Fox would want to front load this episode to prove that the exciting first installment was not simply a fluke. Terror Eaten in an Instant obviously does not have the same demands placed on it and fits comfortably as the eighth episode of its series, blending in as a standard representative of what one might expect from Zhu Ranger. Boy befriends a bullied young kid, Mamoru, who is ostensibly overweight, although even with the obvious fat suit he's wearing, he and his parents don't look all that husky. Granted, this is Japan and I'm used to cholesterol-saturated Americans. Mamoru's tormentors call him Minnesota Fats, which presents a larger degree of familiarity with fictional American pool hustlers from the middle of the century than I would expect from 90s Japanese kids. Boy is at first put off by his new friend's seeming gluttony, but then comes to appreciate it as the family's treasured bonding ritual in a culture where fathers tend to be conspicuously absent at mealtimes. And of course, there's nothing more treasured than a subliminal advertisement demonstrating who might very well share some blame for rising obesity. Bondora, annoyed at her own recent bout of overeating, sends out Dora Kirke to tear apart those family bonds by stealing their precious food as well as torment anyone else who might be eating. Both episodes attempt far broader comedy than any installment we've covered so far. Power Rangers sets up its titular food fight through another parent-appeasing charitable work. The teens are hosting an international food fair to raise money for children's playground equipment, only for it to be wrecked by Bulk Skull and their two henchmen now. The resulting chaos preempted by an obligatory invocation of the words FOOD FIGHT stated directly to the camera might be a little self-indulgent and pat out a bit too much of the runtime, but it provides some creative comedy action set pieces as well as the introduction of the running gag of Principal Kaplan losing his toupee. It's unencumbered silliness and Alpha comes through in the end with replacement dishes of his own, so no need to worry about children having nowhere to play. Zhu Ranger's comedy comes down to one gag about Mamoru and his family. They're fat and they're obsessed with food! While the episode does ultimately portray them as good-natured, loving, and sympathetic, the jokes at their expense run right up to the line of feeling mean-spirited. When their food goes missing, they get into a fist fight! Because they're fat! Mamoru is crying because he hasn't eaten in three days, which is enough for his entire fat suit to disappear, yet it's all a setup to laugh at him because look, his pants fall down! Because he's literally starving! Get it? And if it wasn't funny enough the first time, we get to see it again in flashback! 
both series are going for very unsophisticated gags, but Food Fight feels far more consistent in keeping with the overall tone of the show. Also, I didn't think I'd be saying this, but Zhu Ranger actually gets a bit tripped up with its adherence to mythology. Dora Kirke is named for the character from the Odyssey, who transforms Odysseus's men into pigs. And like in that story, the Zhu Rangers need the moly herb. Granted, in the Odyssey, the moly herb kept Odysseus from being turned into a pig himself. This moly herb causes Dora Kirke to throw everything up. All of that's fine, though. The problem comes in the introduction of the character Gnome. He will be an occasional ally throughout the series, but he feels pretty random and tacked on here. It's fun seeing Don smacked around, but other than that, this feels like an extended detour. He just happens to have the moly herb, but will only give it to them if they eat lots and lots of food. The other four Zhu Rangers fail the task, and I'm not gonna lie, Geki declaring, There's a limit, even if it's for justice, is hilarious and so perfectly in character. Ultimately, it's up to Boy, but can he survive eating two carrots? And once again, the episode feels too silly and not in a good way. Not only does this phobia of carrots come out of nowhere, it feels simultaneously overplayed and underplayed. If you're gonna go this route, then go all out and have the entire banquet be carrot-based dishes. But two carrots? That's the challenge? That's how Boy proves he cares enough about Mamoru to deserve the moly herb? Usually I'm complaining that every time the Zhu Rangers have to earn something, the Power Rangers have it simply given to them. But it's the opposite here. The Zhu Rangers need an herb, and this guy comes along and gives it to them. Sure, Gnome is a bit more cantankerous about it than Zordon, but the point still stands. In Power Rangers, Saban once again has the monster suit, so Pudgy Pig gets to gorge himself at the food fair. And Trini notices that while everything else has been ransacked, the spicy foods, including this moldy-like radish, have been left alone. So the Power Rangers figure out a strategy based on their observations of a monster's characterizations, which comes about due to its natural connection to events in Power Rangers exclusive footage. It's nice that Zhu Ranger pulls in Greek mythology, but the way it's implemented does not fit in its story nearly as well, and makes the Zhu Rangers far more passive than their American counterparts. So for story, Power Rangers wins by finally delivering something completely cohesive, managing to improve on what they were handed. They even recreated the giant sushi! For characters, the Mamoru family is a bit over the top, but are still so cute and pure that I have to give this to Zhu Ranger. And for action, most of it is the same, but Food Fight has a... FOOD FIGHT! Which gives an edge to Power Rangers, meaning Mighty Morphin Power Rangers wins this contest. It pulls together all of its best tropes, takes advantage of its source material rather than fighting against it, and creates exactly enough new material to sell what little of their altered concept can't be told with stock footage. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about our next matchup, Big Sisters vs. Run Prince of the Eggs and Monkeys No More. Yep, once again, it's a Zhu Ranger two-parter condensed into a single Power Rangers episode, which has yet to do MMPR any favors. But pairing Big Sisters with Food Fight is very illustrative. Production-wise, they come one right after the other, but while Food Fight was bumped ahead to become the first non-origin story viewers would see, Big Sisters was buried, pushed nearly a month later to the final batch of episodes before the Green Ranger came along and made kids forget about all the awkward growing pains of the early episodes. If this one is remembered for anything, it's the flying car. Prince of the Eggs doesn't arbitrarily dig into Greek mythology, but continues to expand Zhu Ranger's mythology. Turns out Bondora is also responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs, but two remaining eggs were sealed in a chest by guys with very bad wigs, and put out to sea where they were found by the Apello tribe of Dalos Island, who have guarded them ever since. They've already been cursed with monkey tails for being tricked into eating godly fruit, and this is their last chance to not screw things up. But since Bondora is on the hunt for the eggs, young Prince Euro seeks out the Zhu Rangers courtesy of his inventor caretaker's flying Volkswagen Beetle. Unfortunately, after said beetle accidentally lands into the living room of a young girl, Emiko, she gets swept up in all of this too. Not only that, but Bondora has enlisted Dora Cockatrice, who can not only cut holes in the fabric of reality, but is the very monster who tricked the Apello tribe in the first place, and is not above impersonating Emiko to get through the barrier. 
Ultimately, the eggs are lost at sea again, but an impassioned speech convinces the gods to lay off these poor gullible people and take away their tails. It should be obvious that Power Rangers was not going to touch this plot with a 10-foot pole, and they probably should have skipped adapting this entirely, but they didn't. But to craft their own replacement story, they seemed focused on three very specific attributes aside from the monster. A box of eggs, a flying car, and for some reason, this particular shot of a little girl being suspended by a rope and caught by Daijujin. And that last bit of all things serves as the title plot of Big Sisters. And I can kind of get that. As a kid, I really enjoyed moments that sold the idea that the Megazord actually is a giant robot, instead of what I knew it was, a guy in a suit. I also loved when his hands would randomly shift from molded plastic to articulated glove hand. Power Rangers even crafts their own giant Megazord hand to recreate a shot from the original. So it's a good moment, worthy of carrying across to the West, but the attached story doesn't buoy it in the slightest. Emiko is adapted into Maria, a young girl that Kimberly and Trini have volunteered to Big Sister for. And it just so happens that Rita needs a child to open the box of the legendary Power Eggs. Eggs created by morphine masters that have... a power. Power Eggs? I don't get it. I don't know, we never see them do anything. God, this is just a mess. Let's start with Maria herself. In order to make use of the wide shots of Emiko, Maria has to match her overall aesthetic. But while Emiko looks suitably cute in her pigtails and sweater skirt combo, Maria just looks really, really out of place in this show. She looks like she should be receiving a horrifically ironic comeuppance in Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Maria is introduced as an incurable prankster, turning off the hot water to the men's showers. So you're thinking, ah, she's gonna be a zany handful for Kimberly and Trini, and she's going to have to learn a lesson about being nice. But no. That characteristic is immediately dropped. She gets one brief, tepid, generic scene of bonding with the girls before she's kidnapped. She retrieves the egg box off screen because Power Rangers apparently has neither the chicken costume nor an egg box. And she's not seen again until she has to be rescued, at which point she is whisked away. The existence of this character feels completely obligatory, there to service the available footage, connect the dots of this paper-thin plot, and to once again demonstrate that the Power Rangers volunteer for literally every good deed. Chunky Chicken, Power Rangers' answer to Dora Cockatrice, faces a similar lack of integration. Rita requests this monster specifically as one that might be good at kidnapping children, but he has nothing to do with the kidnapping of Maria. The putties do that because, again, there is no available chicken suit to film new material. Dora Cockatrice can take on any form in order to trick people, Chunky Chicken does not. Dora Cockatrice uses his scissors to cut holes in reality and pull people into other dimensions, and the Zhu Rangers have to figure out a way to find those dimensional holes. Chunky Chicken does not do this at all until the final fight where he suddenly starts randomly jumping through dimensions without any prior indication that he could do that. As a matter of fact, there is more than one Dora Cockatrice. Or at least it's rebuilt and resuscitated. He's defeated at the end of part one, so Bondora commissions another one in the second part, literally called Dora Cockatrice 2. Overall, the humor here in Zhu Ranger plays much better than it did last time. I particularly like the increasing level of farce in Emiko's home, where she and her mother are still getting used to having a magic car in their living room, only to be interrupted by a bunch of golems, politely ringing the doorbell. Immediately after that, the doorbell rings again, and this time it's the Zhu Rangers asking, Hey, did a bunch of weird guys happen to come around here? It's fantastic, and unlike with Eaton in an instant, the campy tone plays perfectly. Finally, there's the rad bug. And yes, like the image of the Megazord catching a falling girl, Billy's invention of a fantastical flying car is definitely something that imprinted on my tiny little child brain. And hey, they actually either had the flying car or made a reasonable facsimile of their own. I'd guess the latter given its American driving configuration. I think there are far more original shots of the car in Big Sisters than Sentai footage of it. But story-wise, it feels about as organic to this plot as Gnome did to the last one. It's just kind of there. Communication and teleportation are down, for no established reason. But it just so happens that Billy has made this amazing flying car that can take them to the command center anyway. But the randomness might all be worth it just for this one perfect Richard Horvitz delivery. It, it's 
an old car. See, he's as confused by this whole thing as I am. That's the best moment of the episode. Enjoy it. The Rad Bug is much better used when it returns during the Green Ranger saga, where the command center in disrepair is central to the plot. And, you know, that could be another reason why this episode was placed so close to those. With all of these elements stripped from their original context, Big Sisters feels like a weird mishmash of incompatible ideas, none of which is developed to any satisfaction. It feels simultaneously overstuffed and undercooked. There's not even any room to include Bulk and Skull. They just get shoved into the tag so that Bulk can have a bowl of chili dumped on him for no reason, while Skull is in a completely separate, seemingly disconnected shot, holding a salt shaker for no reason. Did a scene get cut? Interestingly, the story, as it were, of Big Sisters is such a departure from the original that the material more or less gets adapted in reverse. In Jew Ranger, the first setup is kidnapping Emiko to coerce Prince Euro to give up the location of the eggs. Then Dora Cockatrice 2 is created. Then the bad guys find and get the eggs, there's a fight, the eggs are lost. In Big Sisters, Rita finds the eggs, Chunky Chicken is created, there's a fight, the eggs are lost, then Maria is used to coerce the Power Rangers to get the eggs back? I mean, you're the one who saw it happen, Rita. What are they supposed to do that you can't? This comes across as a prelude to how they adapt Ninja Sentai Kaku Ranger for Season 3. This is a very weird episode, and it does not hold together well at all. But I can't deny that the Megazord saving a kid and the introduction of the Rad Bug are surprisingly iconic. So I must admit that they did something right. However, I'm no longer an impressionable child, but a jaded 34-year-old, and clearly this brainless kid show should be judged by those standards. Incoherent mess versus mythology, Jew Ranger wins in story. Character arc that goes nowhere versus a handful of new fun characters, Jew Ranger wins. There's a weird part that was cut out of Power Rangers of this bizarre bomber gang of children that attack the heroes and ultimately lose the eggs, Jew Ranger wins. And Jew Ranger wins. Are you really surprised? So thanks for watching, and thanks as always to my more phenomenal patrons who keep the channel going. Clearly, this is an ongoing series, so check out the earlier episodes in the playlist, including the videos I made last decade examining much more briefly how the entire Zordon era was adapted from various Super Sentai series. Don't forget to check out my recent review of the official Star Wars radio drama, and, you know, there's Dragon Ball Dissection as well. See you next time!